Hi everyone, my name is Joe Kelly. I'm the program host with the Community Relations Department at the Rochester Hills Public Library. And I am here to welcome you to this evening's uh, Smart Towns program, The Miraculous Mind, with Dr. Brian Stogner, a professor of psychology and the president of Rochester University, uh, professor of psychology at the same university. Uh, Smart Towns is a community collaboration to foster lifelong learning. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this uh, with many wonderful partners that we have, such as Rochester University, you can visit our uh, website at smarttowns.rhpl.org. Uh, to register for other programs, uh, you can visit our website at rhpl.org or calendar.rhpl.org. You can find programs such as uh, our program, which will host next Tuesday, May 25th at 7 p.m., uh, which is Becoming Mindful and Resilient in the Age of Anxiety, which will be presented in partnership with Rochester Area Youth Assistance. Uh, for tonight's program, uh, we will have the audience muted throughout the program, and you can feel free to ask questions in the chat feature. And at the end, we will leave uh, a little bit of time for questions and answers. Uh, and like I said, you can leave those questions in the chat feature. After our introduction here, I will leave a little message so you can all see where that is. And you can leave any questions throughout and we'll answer those at the end of our, uh, right after our little presentation tonight. Uh, the program tonight will be recorded. It should be available to view about one week from today on our YouTube page and on our website at rhpl.org. And finally, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library for helping to financially support our programs. We're very grateful. Now, I'd like to start tonight's presentation by welcoming our presenter, Dr. Brian Stogner. Dr. Stogner, please take it away. Thanks very much, Joe, appreciate it. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, busy eating your dinner and doing other things uh, from your uh, evening constitutionals uh, over the course of uh, this event. And uh, one of the beauties of uh, Zoom meetings, I guess, is you, uh, you get to do all that stuff while you're sitting in on a Smart Towns presentation. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here and uh, we tried this out earlier and it worked just fine. So I'm hopeful that it will work equally well this time. Uh, so my hope is that you are now seeing, a, a, seeing a, a title slide that says The Miraculous Mind. It's looking good on mine. So tonight, uh, there'll be, uh, this will be kind of a wide ranging presentation. Uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a psychologist uh, by discipline, uh, have worked in clinical psychology and in neuropsychology in particular. Uh, and I'll be talking a lot about psychology tonight, but I'll also be talking about some other disciplines and some other things as they relate to some of the amazing things about the human mind and brain. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the ways in which your mind help you, uh, the ways in which the, uh, the, your mind as it functions allow you to adapt well to your environment, to the world, uh, and then maybe take a look at some broader implications of that for what it means for our society and for our culture and, and what it has meant for our society and culture. We'll talk a little bit about history, we'll talk a little bit about the history of science in particular, but also about some other things too. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, we'll try to save some time for some questions at the end. However, if you do have extremely pressing questions as they come in, uh, Jen Porter, who is uh, the Director of Development and Alumni Relations at Rochester University and is helping out uh, in this presentation is gonna help me monitor the chat function. Uh, so if there's something that uh, is extremely pressing uh, that can't wait till the end, I'll try to get to that the best that I can. So let's talk a little bit about some history of psychological science. This is a picture of Ivan Pavlov. Uh, he's the gentleman with the white beard on the right side of the picture with some of his lab assistants and one of his most important lab assistants, the four-legged one that's there on the left-hand side. You've, I'm sure, heard of Pavlov and you've heard of his work and you've heard of classical conditioning and you probably know the story of the experiments that Pavlov did to discover classical conditioning and this idea of pairing together some previously neutral stimulus, something that a dog or some other animal wouldn't naturally react to in any sort of reflexive or emotional way, 
pairing that together with a, an unlearned stimulus like food to the point where the animal would then react to the previously neutral stimulus. And you probably heard some examples of that. And, and Pavlov's work has become deeply embedded, uh, even in popular culture. He's, there's references to him in songs and television shows and all sorts of things like that. Pavlov's dogs, and they're salivating to a bell, although it's controversial whether Pavlov actually ever even used a bell in his experiments. Everybody knows about that. And what Pavlov discovered with classical conditioning was what really amounts to a universal principle of learning. Essentially, as far as we can tell, any organism on the planet that is capable of learning, as we would define it, is capable of learning by classical conditioning. So when Pavlov figured this out, he was really onto something. He was onto something that applied to every kind of being from a human being to a, a worm or a, a, a fish. And it's a remarkable kind of achievement to make this discovery. And again, most people know a lot about that discovery. What they may not know, though, are some other things about Pavlov that are really interesting. Pavlov was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1904, and we'll talk about some other folks tonight that were awarded the Nobel Prize at various times. But what's really interesting about Pavlov's Nobel is he didn't get his Nobel Prize for his work related to classical conditioning. In fact, he didn't publish his work about classical conditioning until 1903. Uh, and he had been nominated for the Nobel Prize several times prior to that. Uh, and his work on the digestive system of dogs is what actually got him the award of the Nobel Prize. So how is it that somebody who was really a physiologist, even though he's one of the most cited uh, research, uh, researchers in the field of psychology, he wasn't a psychologist, he was a physiologist. How is it that a physiologist figured out this incredibly important psychological process? Well, it was because Pavlov's mind was all about some of the things that we're gonna talk about here tonight. He was meticulous in his measurements, and as I mentioned, he was interested in measuring the digestive systems of animals. And as you probably learned in school, the digestive process begins when you put food in your mouth with saliva, and the enzymes in saliva begin to break down the food. And Pavlov was meticulous about his measurements in his laboratory, and he began to be a little bit annoyed because what he noticed at is as he was setting up his laboratory and his lab assistants, some of whom are pictured here in the background of this uh, picture, as they would come into the laboratory, the dogs would immediately begin to salivate. Pavlov was annoyed by this because it messed up his measurements because he was trying to begin his measurements at a particular point in time when he began his experimental process. And what seemed to be happening was the dogs were doing something and were learning something and were responding to something in their environment that wasn't a part of Pavlov's formal digestive exper uh, experiments. And Pavlov thought to himself, you know what, there's something going on here that's really important. So it was Pavlov noticing something in his environment, noticing something in his work that actually led him to this amazing discovery. He found something that he wasn't looking for. Turns out he was looking for some things that were really important, but what he's remembered for was finding something that he wasn't looking for at all, but because he had an alert mind, because he was curious, because he was creative, he stumbled upon something and noticed something and responded to it in a way that has really changed the world. In some ways, Pavlov is something of a model for some of the other processes and some of the other folks that we're going to talk about here tonight. And that aspect or those aspects of the human mind that relate to curiosity, that relate to being alert, how your mind works to notice things in the environment that you might not necessarily even be looking for is a really important part of what we're going to talk about tonight. And Pavlov kind of helps us begin to think in that way and orient ourselves in that way. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the brain and the mind. And I know there's at least one neuroscientist present uh, here this evening, and there may be others. So I want to begin by apologizing to them what, with what I am sure they will find to be a grotesquely oversimplified explanation of some neurology and neuroscience here tonight. But I want to talk a little bit at, at a very basic level about how the mind works as it relates to how the brain functions. And then I want to talk a little bit about computers and how that kind of relates to some amazing things about the mind. So this is a typical diagram of what a neuron or a nerve cell might look like. Uh, over on the left side of this picture is the receiving end of this neuron. Over on the right side is the sending end of the neuron. And what neurons do is they transmit neurochemical impulses throughout the nervous system. We're going to talk particularly about the central nervous system and even more particularly about the brain, the element of the central nervous system. And these neurons are networked together so that information from multiple different other neurons come into the receiving end of that neuron and are then transmitted out to what may be multiple other neurons on, over on the other end, the sending end of the neuron. And we could talk about synapses and we could talk about neurochemicals and we could talk about neurotransmitters, all sorts of other elements of that. But for now, just think about these amazing cells, we've got something like 86 billion of them typically in our brain. Although if you're over around the age of 20 something, uh, early 20s, you're probably losing them uh, at a relatively rapid rate. Uh, you might also be doing other things in your life and in your mind that contribute to the loss of neurons. But remarkably, because neurons are so good at developing new networks, you can lose hundreds of thousands of them and not really notice a significant difference in the effective functioning of your mind and your brain just because these new networks continue to be built. And as those new networks of neurons are built, these transmitting uh, cells begin to get linked together in all sorts of remarkable ways. And that allows our brain to function and drive our mental processes. So on the one hand, we've got these amazing cells, and that's the stuff that your brain is made of. This is the stuff that your computer is made of. You're sitting at a computer right now, and uh, you're watching this Zoom meeting. And part of what allows you to be able to do that are these amazing microprocessors, these integrated circuits. And there's some remarkable parallels between how neurons work and how integrated circuits work. Again, you could think about neurons as uh, pathways that allow these electrochemical signals to work through the brain, networked with a bunch of other potential pathways. And you could think about an integrated circuit working in a similar way. Now, just as I apologized to the neuroscientists uh, a few moments ago for a grossly oversimplified uh, presentation related to neurons, I'm now going to apologize to any computer scientists who are uh, sitting in the Zoom meeting for a, an equally grotesquely oversimplified explanation about integrated circuits and transistors and how computers work. But there's some similarities. Both of these uh, amazing things allow information to travel through this complex network. Uh, a circuit uh, is like a road where electronic signals flow. And in, in these circuits, in these processors, there are all kinds of transistors. And you can think of transistors as being sort of switches, or uh, if we could stick with the road metaphor, they're like traffic lights that are activated by an electrical signal. And that allows this information to pass throughout the network using this circuits. So you should see the similarity between neurons and these integrated circuits as part of this extremely complex, multi-layered network that is responsible for the transmission of information. So because of that similarity, a lot of cognitive scientists, cognitive psychologists, have talked about the brain and the mind 
using metaphors or analogies or comparisons related to the computer. Some folks even go so far as to say that the way that the brain works and the way that the computer works are essentially the same. And there are several different reasons why that's the case. One real striking similarity in the way that your brain works with neurons and the way that the computer works is that both your brain and neurons and a computer work with an either or principle. With neurons, we talk about this all or none principle. And the idea behind this is, if you think back to the picture of that neuron that I showed you, I'll, uh, the idea was on the, the receiving end of the neuron, information comes in through the networks. And you can think about electrochemical energy as building up to a particular threshold. And when that threshold is hit, the neuron fires. And neurons can do one of two things. They can either rest or fire. They operate in that all or none principle. And if they hit their threshold, they fire, then there's a period of time where they're sort of recovering, a refractory period. And then if they hit the threshold again, they fire again and then again go through that recovery process. Well, a parallel information processing approach to how neurons work is the binary code that tells transistors when to open and close. And just like a neuron can either fire or rest, a transistor can either open or close. And again, you've got these complex networks that work according to this either or principle. And because of that, because the functional operation of a computer and the functional operation of the human brain is so similar, because these things are so similar to each other, the computer model for the brain uh, it is very commonly used to explain both computers and brains, frankly. I want to suggest to you tonight, though, that it does perhaps both brains and computers a disservice to use this metaphor or to use this analogy. Obviously, there's some significant differences. I mean, the integrated circuits and the, the, the components, the mechanisms of the computer are made of things like silicon and other kinds of remarkable substances. Your brain is made of meat. Uh, it's made of cells. It's made of this stuff that our bodies are made of at some sort of level. And somehow this meat produces this amazing sort of communication process. So there, even though there are these striking similarities between the brain and the computer, there are also some striking dissimilarities. One similarity is, uh, if you know something about your computer, you know that uh, you've got this thing called random access memory or short-term memory. And every once in a while, you'll get a notice from your computer that says, hey, you need to shut down some programs so there's enough memory for us to run the other things that you're trying to run. Well, when that happens, you are reaching the capacity of the short-term memory of your computer. Turns out the human mind also has a limited capacity of its short-term memory or of its sensory memory, what it can hold in awareness at any point in time. There's a classic paper in psychology by G.H. Miller called the magical number seven plus or minus two, uh, which is the short-term memory capacity, essentially. It's kind of the comparable to that random access memory of a computer. One place, however, where we begin to see computers and human minds and brains begin to separate from each other is as it relates to long-term memory. Right now, many of you, I'm guessing, when you are storing stuff for the long-term on your computer, you're using the cloud. I love this name. Uh, the cloud just, just has this sort of romanticized image of something that's out there in the ether, and it's like your information is just sort of floating there somewhere in this remarkable way. Well, you know, as it turns out, 
Uh, the cloud is not something that's out there in the ether that's storing a lot of stuff. The cloud is just somebody else's computer. Uh, it's a bigger computer. Uh, it's a more powerful computer. It has a much bigger storage capacity than your computer, but that storage capacity is limited. As it turns out, if you look at what we've learned about the storage capacity and the ability of the human brain to begin to take on more and more information and store more and more information. It appears that the human brain's capacity to take in and store new information is essentially unlimited. Uh, the storage, the long-term storage capacity of a brain appears to be somehow beyond our capacity to fill up. So what this means is if you're a teacher, your students can never say, you know, stop, my brain is full. I can't take in any in uh, store any more information. Ultimately, the brain is capable of storing more information. It also suggests that the ability of the brain to continue to adapt and change has perhaps no limitations. And I want to talk a little bit more about that as the night goes on as well. <coughs> a man, a Russian named Petr Anakin, who actually studied under Ivan Pavlov, did some work related to the brain's capacity to take on new information uh, in a paper that he published called The Biology and Neurophysiology of Conditioned Reflex in 1968. He talked about all sorts of elements of the system of the brain and mind. Anokin was an important figure in the development of systems theory, the idea of feedback in systems theory, something where information enters into the system and feeds back on other elements of the system, creating loops that drive feedback throughout the mechanisms of the different uh, uh, elements of the system. Anokin was really important in the development of the ideas behind that. He said some interesting things in this paper about the brain's capacity for information. One of the things that he said that's pretty remarkable was, he said the minimum number of thought patterns the average human brain can make is the number one, followed by 10.5 million kilometers of typewritten zeros. Just let that sink in and get a visual of that for a second. Um, I think the way Anakin came up with that was he tried to sit down and think about, okay, how many neurons are there and how many networks are there and how many connections do they have? And he sat down and tried to do some math. Uh, I think this is a pretty dramatic sort of image that he creates. Uh, I think it's probably safer rather than talking about numbers like this to just say it looks like what we've got is something like unlimited storage capacity. And the take home message for that is, as Michael Gelb said in a book that we'll talk about a little bit later on, your brain is much better than you think. And I want to talk about some ways that your brain is much better than you think. Your brain is much better than you think because it, it probably has a larger capacity than you think. It's also better because it's probably doing more than you think it is. It is certainly doing more than you can ever be aware of at any particular point in time. One of the things that's become really important in understanding some of the ways that your brain works, kind of works over time and kind of works in the background. And another way that it perhaps departs from the computer model in some ways is to talk about how the brain functions unconsciously. So when you think about the unconscious, and particularly when you hear a psychologist talk about the unconscious, you may immediately think of Sigmund Freud, the gentleman on the left. Freud, although he did not develop the idea of the unconscious part of the mind. He certainly popularized it. He certainly embedded that idea deeply into literature, uh, into the, the psyche of human beings, uh, our awareness of the unconscious, and certainly has deeply put uh, this idea into our culture and into all sorts of systems in some ways that we might not even realize. 
to Freud, the unconscious was primarily about instinctive, some might call them primitive, uh, certainly um, basic kinds of drives and instincts. It was deeply emotional, sometimes uh, even precognitive, uh, so deeply embedded in emotions. Uh, Conflict-based, it's sort of this gurgling, bubbling cauldron of impulses and conflicts. We're not aware of what they are unless we go through good psychoanalysis, according to Freud. But despite the fact that all of those things are not in our awareness, they are driving and influencing our behavior in all kinds of ways. Well, interestingly, Freud didn't spend a lot of time doing what we would think of as laboratory experiments to demonstrate that what he believed to be true about the unconscious was really true. Some folks have done that more recently, but Freud wasn't terribly interested in that. He was far more interested in the clinical applications related to the unconscious. However, more recently, there's become a a growing interest in unconscious thinking by other folks that would not call themselves Freudian. One of those psychologists is a man named Timothy Wilson, pictured here. I could have chosen some other folks, Daniel Wegner or Daniel Gilbert being two uh, examples of psychologists with whom Wilson has collaborated. Uh, And there are others as well who have done some interesting research on the nature of unconscious thought processes. Think about how Wilson conceptualizes the unconscious in a slightly different way uh, than the way Freud sized it up, however. Uh, To Wilson, as he thinks about the unconscious, he doesn't think so much about these basic kind of primal Uh, instinctive or emotional sorts of processes. Wilson believes that the unconscious mind operates very quickly and in the background. It helps us to size up the world around us, helps us to understand our environment. It helps us to sort through a, a constant barrage of stimuli that are assaulting our senses. The great psychologist, uh, probably the first great American psychologist, William James, referred to the world as a blooming, buzzing confusion. Uh, And he was talking about how we're bombarded by all kinds of information all the time. And what Wilson says, and what he has demonstrated experimentally, is that the unconscious helps us to sort through all this barrage of stimuli that are coming at us all the time and to separate what's relevant from what's irrelevant. And it happens without our awareness. That's why it's called the unconscious. It happens without our direction then. It's not because we are deliberately or intentionally sorting through these things. It's just the way your mind works. It's just the way your unconscious mind works. Wilson contends that this is a pervasive set of processes, that it's sophisticated, uh, it helps us to solve problems, it helps us to understand our environment, it helps us even to set goals and initiate action. In fact, Wilson refers to this, uh, these sets of processes as the adaptive unconscious. He says, these unconscious thought process helps, processes help us to adapt to the environment in some powerful and meaningful ways, all while we are consciously thinking of something else. And we'll see some examples of that adaptive unconscious at work when we think about the miracle uh, that is how the mind functions. So your mind has a larger capacity. Your brain's better than you think from that perspective. It's doing more than you think. It's carrying on all kinds of processes in the background all the time. And it also helps us to understand the world and put the pieces of the world together in a way that makes sense to us. Take a look at this picture. I'm guessing that if I ask you, you know, who this is, you can tell me pretty quickly that this is uh, former President Barack Obama. 
Now, in order to come up with that idea, in order to conclude that, I'm going to back up here so we don't have to, uh, to so we don't continue to look at that picture uh, while I'm talking about it. <coughs> you had to process <coughs> some information in a particular way. What you saw was an upside down picture. And again, if we're thinking about the relationship of the human mind to computers, facial recognition uh, was a really tough nut to crack uh, in computer science and in computer programming. Uh, now, it turns out the computers have gotten much, much better at facial recognition. But the way they work is that they, is they go in and they pick out particular details and they kind of put those details together uh, and match them with templates that they have uh, in order to be able to make a determination about whether a face looks as the computer would expect it to look. What we do and what the human brain and what the human mind does seems to work differently than that. It seems to work holistically uh, in putting the pieces together. Uh, and it looks like uh, humans develop this facial recognition capability extremely early developmentally. It's not something that takes a lot of practice, it just sort of seems to come with what it means to have a human mind that you're working with. But the other really interesting thing about human facial recognition is not only are we able to put it together in this holistic fashion, but your mind is actually able to put pieces together so that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and so that the whole is in fact more complete and more perfect than the sum of its parts. So when you looked at this picture, you concluded that it was Barack Obama, and I'm guessing not many of you had to grab your computer and turn it upside down to make a determination that this was a picture of President Obama upside down. If you had grabbed your computer and turned it upside down, what you would have seen was this. And as you can see, this rather alarming looking picture, uh, in fact, it's kind, of, it's kind of freaky to even look at this. I won't leave it up there for very long. Uh, you can see that what we saw was not exactly an upside down picture of Barack Obama. What we saw was a rather distorted combination of details. Yet, your brain didn't have trouble, your mind didn't have trouble putting that all together. Uh, it made sense of something and created a whole out of parts that not only were upside down, but were inconsistent. Some were upside down, some were right side up, they were distorted. And what you were able to do was take that image on the left, make sense of it, make it look right to you in spite of the fact that the details that were there uh, were actually not right. And what's pretty amazing is your mind's ability to do that across all different kinds of amazing situations and circumstances in your environment. Uh, your brain is better than you think. Your brain is more skilled than you think, as well as having a larger capacity than you think. So your brain also not only allows us to put these perceptions together, not only allows us to adapt to uh, ambiguities in our environment and create more complete pictures sometimes that are even aware, uh, uh, available to us, uh, our brain also helps us to guide our reactions to the world in a very adaptive fashion. Someone said once, I'm afraid of three kinds of snakes. Big snakes, little snakes, and sticks that look like snakes. Um, if you saw something like this when you're walking or, uh, through the woods, particularly if you were in an environment where you might expect to see snakes, even though this is a stick, you might get a gut feeling, you might get this sense unconsciously that there's something there that you should be concerned about. Um, and your adaptive unconscious responds to things particularly responds to threats in the environment uh, in ways that allow us to be alert, to be aware. Uh, it turns out that humans have this strange sort of ability, and I'll bet you've experienced this. You're in a situation 
uh, you're sitting in perhaps uh, this is not something that we have done quite as much uh, most recently in the uh, pandemic environment, but you remember the days when you would sit in a restaurant. Uh, you remember the days when you would sit at a Starbucks and you would sip your coffee and you would work on something in your laptop or you would read a book or you would read a newspaper or something like that. And I'll bet all of you at some point in time have had the experience of sitting in that kind of an environment and you get this feeling that someone is looking at you. You get that sense that, oh, and you begin, you might even begin to look around. And I'm guessing you've probably had that feeling at particular points in time. And you've looked around the room and you have in fact seen that there was someone looking at you. Perhaps you caught their eye for a second and they were embarrassed and they averted their gaze. Or perhaps it was someone that you knew and they saw you and they recognized you and they greeted you in that way. As it turns out, our minds seem to be prepared to pick up cues like that in our environment. They have an adaptive function for us. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you look at a stick and you think it's a snake, that's an error of a particular kind. If you look at a snake and think it's a stick, that's an error of another kind. Which of those two errors is potentially more dangerous for a human being? Well, it's pretty obvious that it's probably adaptive for us, particularly if we live in an environment where there are a lot of snakes. Uh, it turns out that uh, you're probably more adaptive to overreact to a stick than you are to underreact to a snake. Interestingly, if we think back about Pavlov and we think about uh, things like phobias, and how we learn to be afraid of particular things. Human beings seem primed to kind of get the willies a little bit and to kind of get the creeps about snakes. Now, some people have pet snakes. They name them cute names. They let them crawl over them. They do all sorts of things like that. And it's not that we have this this deeply embedded sense that we always have to stay away from snakes and we can't overcome that. It's just that human beings seem to be prepared to learn something in a particular way that may have an adaptive function. This interesting looking gentleman is a biologist named Robert Sapolsky. One of the things that uh, he has written is a book uh, as well as a paper and several articles called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Sapolsky talks about this prepared learning idea. And he also talks about how, uh, I mean, if you think about how the human mind works, maybe this is sort of the flip side of it a little bit. He says, you know, if you think about a zebra, when a zebra is out there grazing on the savanna uh, and a lion shows up, the zebra reacts with the same kind of physiological response that you and I would react to if we saw a lion chasing us. We call it the fight or flight response. Uh, it's perhaps more politically correct now to refer to it as it's more commonly referred to as the emergency response. It's this mobilizing all systems go physiological and psychological emotional response to I am in danger. What Sapolsky says is that zebras have this same experience that humans have, except zebras have, zebras have it for what Sapolsky describes as three minutes of screaming terror followed by nothing. It's over with. It's either, it's either over with because they have escaped from the lion and they don't have to worry about it anymore, or it's over with because they didn't escape from the lion and it's, it's literally over with for that zebra. Either way, there's not this chronic sense of anxiety and dread. Well, it may be that the adaptive unconscious that primes us to have a, a set of vigilance about our environment in some ways may prime us to be hypervigilant at times, particularly if our learning history drives it in a particular way. May end up not necessarily always being a positive thing, but generally speaking, Wilson and others would say, these kinds of processes are adaptive. They are good for us. They help us. Another way that your mind and brain is better than you think is you notice more, you filter more, and you develop insights 
that you might not even be aware of. So fascinating study done a long, long time ago by a psychologist named Norman Meyer. This has been referred to as the two chords study. <coughs> Excuse me. In his book, Blink, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who writes a lot about the adaptive unconscious, describes uh, in a lot of detail Meyer's study and a lot of other uh, the elements of some of the things that I'm talking about tonight. And Meyer's study was interesting. He, he, he put his subjects in a room, uh, and in the room were all kinds of tools. Um, there were uh, objects, there were furniture, and he hung ropes uh, on two ends uh, of the room. Looks something like this. And what Meyer asked the folks to do is they walked into this room with this sort of equipment there. He said, okay, your job is to tie the two ends or these two ropes together end to end. And not only is that your job, but your job is to also try to figure out how many different ways, given the resources that you have here at your disposal, how many different ways, how many different approaches, how many different ways of solving the problem can you come up with to tie these two ropes together? Well, if you held one end of one of the ropes, you can't quite reach the other one. So one of the solutions that was available to you is not, well, I just grab one rope with one hand and I grab the other rope with the other hand and I bring them together. That wouldn't work. However, there were, as far as Meyer could tell, four other possibilities about how you could bring these two ropes together. One thing that you could do is you could grab a chair or something else that was in the room and you could anchor one of the ropes to that chair or that object, leave it there as you tied it, stretch it over and tie it down, and then walk over, grab the other rope, bring it over to the anchored end, uh, and tie them together. That's solution number one. Solution number two is you could find some longer piece. There were extension cords in the toolbox and some other things like that. You could tie a piece of an extension cord or something to lengthen one of the ropes onto the end of the rope, walk it over, now having lengthened it, and pull the other rope over, put them together, and tie them together. A third thing that you could do is you could grab one end of the rope, go over as far as you could, and then grab a stick. There was a st actually a stick with a hook on it in the room and reach out, hook the other rope and draw it back over toward you, bring them together and tie it together. Well, what Meyer discovered was those three possibilities were pretty readily and pretty easily discovered by the folks who were sitting in the room, by the folks who were uh, the experimental participants. However, there was a fourth option. Some of you may have been thinking about it now. Some of your minds may have been working now as you've thought it through. A fourth option was to take some heavy object that was in the toolbox or in the room and tie that heavy object onto one end of one of the ropes and swing it back and forth like a pendulum. And as the pendulum swung close to the other rope, you could grab it and then pull the two ropes together. Well, interestingly, the vast majority of the people in Meyer's study did not come up with that fourth option. And Meyer would allow the participants to sit and to think in the room and to try to troubleshoot and problem solve. And he would wait 10 minutes. And generally, almost all the participants came up with three of the four solutions, but they missed out on the pendulum solution. After 10 minutes of people not being able to come up with a solution, Meyer would casually walk through the room and would walk past the ropes toward a window that was on one side of the room. And as he walked past the ropes, he would brush up against one of the ropes in such a way that it would cause the rope to swing back and forth. Guess what happened? Aha! Almost all the participants, after they saw Meyer do that, got the fourth solution, the pendulum solution. 
All right, now so far, that's maybe not terribly surprising, maybe not even terribly interesting. What was really interesting, though, was the explanation that people came up with for how they got the idea. People essentially said, yeah, you know, I just was thinking and it came to me. Uh, one uh, professor of psychology created this fascinating explanation for how he imagined, you know, a, a pendulum, and it just it just had to be that. And he imagined a monkey swinging from a tree, and you know, all sorts of thought processes that he went through. Uh, almost no one said, "Well, yeah, I saw you walk by the thing, and it started swinging, and uh, then it dawned on me, hey, yeah, it could be a pendulum." Meyer concluded that the participants weren't lying. He concluded that they weren't trying to make themselves look good. What he concluded was that a lot of what had gone there on there was unconscious processing of information and a realization of things while they were thinking of something else so that they were not even aware of how they realized what actually occurred. Timothy Wilson's research uh, related to this uh, has, has really been fascinating as he has confirmed that often we are not that good at explaining how we came up with solutions to things. He wrote a book, in fact, Wilson did, summarizing some of this research, and the title of the book is Strangers to Ourselves. Uh, and what he essentially says is there's so much that's going on in our adaptive unconscious that helps us understand the world and so much of that is going on outside of our, aware, our awareness that sometimes we don't know how we've come up with things. Those gut feelings that we have are sometimes a product of that adaptive unconscious. Those flashes of insight are sometimes a product of our adaptive unconscious. Those solutions to problems that have seemed to evade us could very well be a product of the fact that we have this amazing capability uh, in our psyche to come up with things uh, that are outside of our awareness. So your brain, your mind is coming up with things that you're not aware of. It's more skilled than you think of. The other thing that's really important is that your brain's kind of operating on a couple of different levels. This uh, the gentleman on the left is a psychologist named Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics along with his colleague Amos Tversky in uh, 2002. Uh, I, I wonder if economists get upset when psychologists win their Nobel Prizes uh, because Kahneman's not an economist, uh, he's a psychologist. He won his Nobel Prize uh, along with uh, his, related to his work with Tversky, who was deceased in 2002 when Kahneman was awarded the prize. Because of their work related to judgment and decision making and how it drives the economy and economic decisions that people make. Uh, economists for a long, long time operated with the conclusion that people will tend to calculate carefully what their best interest is, and they will act in their own best interest. What Kahneman and Tversky demonstrated was the reality is people sometimes operate according to quick, uh, sometimes unconscious decisions that they're not even aware of. Kahneman said we've got really two mental systems. We've got a fast system and a slow system, and that fast system is intuitive, uh, it's quick, uh, it helps us to make judgments very quickly and sometimes respond to the environment when we need to respond very quickly. And we also have this slower system that's far more deliberative and far more intellectual. Uh, and that allows us to function when we really need to be more deliberative in our decision making and in our thought processes and in our analyses of things. Kahneman says, both of these systems are really, really important. And the fast one in particular often operates unconsciously outside of our awareness. This rather pleasant looking gentleman is a psychologist named Howard Gardner. In the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s, I think it was 1984, Gardner wrote a book that summarized his research. The book uh, is a classic, it's called Frames of Mind. And what Gardner concluded was that in many ways, your mind or your brain 
not only is better than you think in all sorts of ways, it's also smarter than you think. The reason your brain is smarter than you think is because Gardner concluded that intelligence is a much more complex thing than we have often thought of or we did often think of it as being. Uh, from the time that people really began to think about intelligence, there were some conclusions or some beliefs that people had about it. People tended to think, for example, that intelligence is just one thing. And it's either a really big thing, you got a lot of it, or it's a little thing, you don't have very much about it, of it. Uh, and when we thought of intelligence as one thing, uh, there were all sorts of conclusions that we would draw about it. It was believed that intelligence was primarily innate. Uh, it was believed that, you know, you either came into the world with the right kinds of genetic predisposition so that you had a lot of general intelligence or you didn't have very much of it and there wasn't a whole lot that you could do about it. Well, Gardner's work, uh, at, through some extensive and outstanding experimental work, sort of debunked the idea that intelligence was just one thing, sort of debunked the idea that intelligence was innate. He suggested, first of all, that intelligence is probably more like eight things. Now, actually, it turns out that when he first wrote his book, there were seven of them. He added an eighth, the naturalist intelligence. He added that far more recently. But take a look at this diagram and you'll get a sense of how Gardner thought about and how his empirical work seemed to support the idea that, you know, as it turns out, intelligence, how smart you are, how smart the typical human is, is a much more multi-layered, multi-dimensional, multifaceted, call it what you will, and complex set of ideas or concepts than just the idea that intelligence is one thing and some people have a lot of it and some people have a little of it. One of the ways that this idea kind of played itself out in common sense in a popular culture is you've all heard talk about how some people are book smart and some people are street smart. Uh, and every now and then you find somebody that's both. Uh, well, that's sort of the idea that there's more than one way to be smart. Uh, although even though we had that idea in our popular culture, that idea really didn't carry forward into places like schools and businesses and workplaces uh, and even families uh, in some ways. So that people began to understand that, yeah, you know, the mind is a lot more complex and maybe is smarter in some ways than we're ever really aware of until Gardner came along. Gardner suggested, we'll just take a really quick look at these things, that there are about eight different ways uh, to be intelligent or to have intelligence. Uh, he suggested that one of those ways is what he called bodily kinesthetic intelligence. This is uh, a connection, a deep connection between the mind and the body. So here's one of the really interesting things about intelligence and about mental processes. The more we're learning about intelligence and mental processes, the more that we're learning about the impact of other parts of your body than just your brain, and particularly other parts of your body than just your cortex, the upper part of your brain. Uh, and bodily kinesthetic intelligence, this, is, this ability to sort of understand uh, how your mind and your body are connected together and behave in ways that demonstrate that is, is a pretty powerful thing. And if you see it in action, you notice it. Think of great dancers. Think of brilliant ice skaters. Think of amazing athletes. Uh, these tend to be people who have immense bodily kinesthetic intelligence. Then there are people with musical intelligence. People think of people like Mozart or Ella Fitzgerald or people who have this ability to discern sounds, have the ability to, uh, there are people who have uh, something resembling perfect pitch. They understand tone. They have uh, a sense of rhythm that seems to be well-developed. They can, they can perceive subtle shadings and timbres of different kinds of sounds. Uh, that's a, a separate kind of intelligence. What Gardner suggested was sometimes you see these things, these types of intelligence correlated with each other, but you also see them function 
relatively independently of each other. So it's not just that, yeah, really smart people are all these things. In reality, it's far more common that some people will have great strengths in some of these areas, and some people will have relative weaknesses in other areas. Uh, spatial intelligence, visualizing the world and understanding spatial relationships. Think of people like architects, think of sculptors, think of amazing artists. When I think of spatial intelligence, uh, I think of an experience that I had um, when I was working my way through college uh, during the summers, uh, I would often do construction work. And one summer I did a lot of work with uh, a man uh, applying aluminum siding uh, and vinyl siding to houses. And if you've ever put on siding, uh, you know that you know, when you start at the bottom and you're working your way up, it goes pretty smoothly, but then you come to windows and you have to make cuts around the windows to make it work. And you can figure that out, you can make that work and you make the siding work good. But then when you get toward the top, you get roof lines and you get gables and you get eaves. And sometimes you get sort of interesting and complex shapes at the top and you've got to make your cuts uh, with that siding to match those shapes. Well, as I was learning how to do that, I would always, when I got ready to make a cut that was kind of complex, I would, I would grab a piece of scrap siding, stick my pencil behind my ear, and I would clamber up the ladder, uh, and I would take out my tape measure, and I would cut, I would measure very carefully, and I would draw myself a little diagram of how the piece should look with, and how the lengths of each side and each angle should look. Then I would get my diagram on the back of my piece of scrap siding, go back down uh, the ladder, and I would put the siding on the saw and I would cut it. You measure twice, you cut once, and, and, uh, and putting on siding and in other kinds of construction as well. Uh, and, you know, early on, even though I had measured carefully, even though I had drawn my picture carefully, early on, I had to make multiple trips up and down that ladder to cut the thing properly to make it work, to make it fit. Well, my friend, uh, who was the supervisor of the job, he had uh, put on aluminum siding and vinyl siding for a long, long time. And he approached measuring and cutting these complex angles and these complex pieces far differently than I did. What he would do would be grab his tape measure, run up the ladder, make several measurements, run back down the ladder, grab the piece of siding, never wrote anything down, never drew a picture. He would grab the siding, he would slap it on the saw, he would cut it, run back up the ladder, nail it in place. It fit beautifully every time. I was amazed and mystified to see him in action. And one day as we were taking a break and uh, drinking coffee or something, he was he was giving me a hard time about being a college boy and he was talking about how I was so smart and he was so dumb and you know, he, all he could do was you know, put on siding and I was gonna do other things and I stopped him and I said, wait a minute. And I, I kind of explained to him what I had observed that I just explained to you. And I said to him, anybody who can do what you can do is not stupid you have got a kind of intelligence that's far superior to mine as it relates to visual spatial relationships. Um, and so that's an example of, of one of those kinds of intelligence. Uh, logical mathematical intelligence. Think about people who uh, just sort of get it, who are good at math. They pick up mathematical concepts particularly easily. Uh, think about people like Stephen Hawking and people like Isaac Newton uh, and other folks like um, Marie Curie who, uh, who were uh, brilliant scientists and brilliant mathematicians. Uh, interpersonal intelligence. Uh, Daniel Goleman refers to this sort of thing as it, as it uh, relates to emotional intelligence. This is the idea that you have interpersonal sensitivity and you're tuned in to the feelings and motives of other people. Um, uh, intrapersonal uh, intelligence, insight into yourself uh, and understanding how you tick and what motivates you. Linguistic intelligence. There's some people who are wordsmiths, some people who are good with words. Think about uh, wonderful writers or wonderful poets. Uh, 
And then the eighth of those intelligences, naturalist intelligence, think about people like Charles Darwin or Jane Goodall, people who understand nature, who understand living things, who are connected to nature in all sorts of ways. Uh, what Gardner said was, your mind at some level or another connects to these eight different types of intelligences. And in reality, these are things that can be developed. They are not predominantly innate, although there may be some innate element of them, but your brain is multidimensional in the way that it, it, it processes information. And there's a lot of different ways to be smart. Um, turns out, there are some people, however, who seem to be smart in all sorts of ways. And maybe the best example of this, and one of the best examples of this is Leonardo da Vinci. <coughs> Could be that da Vinci was eight for eight uh, in terms of his intelligences. A remarkable human being, truly a Renaissance man. <coughs> Back in the late 1990s, Michael Gelb wrote this book called How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And what he did was suggest that if you took a look at da Vinci's life, you could learn an awful lot about genius. You could learn an awful lot about how the mind can be developed to work in remarkable ways, to solve problems, to analyze difficult circumstances. Da Vinci was a pretty remarkable individual. Uh, that may be the most gross understatement that you'll hear tonight. Uh, obviously, he, uh, he's most noted for being a, an amazing artist. And uh, if you've ever had an opportunity to actually see the Mona Lisa, it's this remarkable experience. Uh, you, you just feel it's almost a spiritual experience, uh, even though you're in, you're in this crowded room in the Louvre and, and you look at this, what to me was a surprisingly small painting. Uh, and as you look at it in this very protected place, uh, you do begin to grab hold of the idea that it was a product of true genius that created this work of art. But da Vinci seemed to have a genius in all sorts of other ways as well. Now, it turns out he didn't publish a lot of his thinking outside of uh, his artistic endeavors, but he did keep several dozen notebooks, maybe 30 notebooks or so. And he wrote and sketched extensively in these notebooks, demonstrating uh, an amazing genius, an amazing intelligence uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, if you look at anatomy, obviously some of the drawings that he did uh, capture uh, human anatomy in a way that no one had ever done before. Actually, uh, he did it for equine anatomy as well because his drawings of, of horses are, are similarly remarkable. Uh, he was the first person to, to get a good sense of uh, some of the structures of, and the ventricles of the brain and of the heart. Um, he did all sorts of uh, uh, remarkable studies uh, of the uh, things like unborn children. Uh, trying to understand exactly what was going on in the development process. Uh, amazing uh, pioneer in botanical science, understood geology and understood physics. Uh, did some amazing things and said some amazing things. Uh, long before the time of other people who are more noted for some of these discoveries or some of these principles, 40 years before Copernicus came along, Da Vinci wrote in his notebook, the sun does not move. Of course, he wrote it in Italian. He actually wrote it in capital letters. He added, the earth is not in the center of the circle of the sun, nor in the center of the universe. So 40 years before Copernicus, Da Vinci had a heliocentric, not a geocentric uh, idea related to the solar system. 60 years before Galileo, he thought it would be a really good idea if a large magnifying lens could be employed to look at the surface of the moon uh, and other kinds of heavenly bodies. And he sketched what such a lens might actually look at. 200 years before Newton, think about that, okay? When we think about Isaac Newton, 
also arguably one of the greatest geniuses to ever live, two centuries before Newton began to talk about gravity, and we think about Newton as understanding and helping us understand gravitation far better than, than we ever did before, Leonardo wrote, every weight tends to fall towards the center by the shortest possible way. He also added, every heavy substance presses downward and cannot be upheld perpetually. Therefore, the whole earth must become spherical. Uh, so even prior to Columbus, uh, long before Newton, this is a guy who was saying, yeah, there's something that we might call gravity. And as it turns out, you know, the earth, the earth isn't flat. Uh, it must be round. So da Vinci in some ways seems to exemplify some of the highest levels of what the human mind is capable of. Uh, and in this book, Gelb talks about how we can begin to develop the human mind in some ways as well. Uh, and he talks about what he describes as da Vincian principles. He names them quaintly in Italian. Uh, uh, but just to quickly summarize a few of these things, and we'll kind of begin to, to wind down a little bit about what we're talking about here. But what Gelb said was, what you have to do is, if you look deeply into what Newton did, if you look at his writings, if you observe the work that he, uh, that he put together over the, over the course of his lifetime, you can see some habits that he developed. And it could be if we were able to develop some of these habits, a couple of things would happen. One is we might be able to develop the amazing potential of our minds to a far greater extent. And the other is we might begin to take advantage of some of the things that our minds already tend to do if we began to develop some of these propensities uh, and therefore sort of begin to see how the, the capabilities and the potentials of the mind get developed uh, into greater human flourishing. To quickly summarize these seven principles, uh, if there are Italian speakers out there uh, in the group, I will apologize to them as I've apologized to some other groups uh, over the course of the presentation as well, uh, uh, because I'll, I'm sure I'll butcher these pronunciations. But curiosita, which is basically being curious, this idea that we need to have uh, this insatiable approach to trying to find out things. Uh, at Rochester University, we talk about the importance of lifelong learning. Da Vinci was a lifelong learner. Uh, your brain is capable of continuing to learn new things. Your mind is capable of developing these new connections and these new networks. Keep feeding that curiosity. Keep going. Keep learning. Uh, we, we never get too old to be able to continue to develop our mental processes. Demonstrazione, independent thinking, the idea that you test knowledge through experience, you experiment, you persist, you learn from your mistakes, uh, you continue, again, going along with the idea of lifelong learning, that you continue to test things, you continue to try to weigh evidence and understand how the things that you're learning connect to the things that you've known before. Sensazioni, uh, the refinement of the five senses. Da Vinci was really interested in developing particularly the visual sense of noticing things. Uh, there's a lot of writing now about mindfulness, uh, living life with a greater sense of awareness of the things that are around us. Uh, it's remarkable to me how so many folks live what, what I think of as rather anesthetized lives. Uh, sort of uh, kind of not know you do whatever comes next you don't take notice of the world around you uh, you don't develop the senses through which you take all kinds of information uh, and this idea that you know, one should develop those things and cultivate that mindfulness is something that da Vinci seemed to do uh, this next one, sfumato is a really interesting one and my understanding is that this literally means going up in smoke uh, the idea was that uh, ambiguity, paradox, uncertainty, Da Vinci was okay with all of that. He, he was sort of embracing of the idea that, yes, some things are nuanced. Some things aren't going to make 
perfect sense. All those ducks might not line up in a row. And it may be that in the complexity of the universe around us, there are going to be some things that are paradoxical. There are going to be some things that are uncertain. There are going to be some things, if we put this into uh, current day parlance, that don't necessarily fit well into a 30-second sound bite. These are hard times that we are living in, hard times for nuance. Uh, most people don't have patience for nuance. Most people don't have patience for uncertainty. You got to have a firm position. You got to be able to summarize it in a short period of time. And it's really much better if you can take a picture of it and post it up on Instagram uh, so everybody knows where you stand. Uh, and Da Vinci understood that the world just doesn't work like that. Uh, and being able to embrace some of that ambiguity and tolerate it and begin to work through it is a way that we can develop our minds. This next one relates to the balance between science and art, the balance between logic and imagination. And uh, maybe nobody uh, better embodied the ability to balance and develop both of those things than uh, Da Vinci. Da Vinci Corporalita was also very into physical and mental health. Uh, he was uh, apparently a regular exerciser. He was conscious of what he ate. Uh, he cultivated grace, fitness, uh, cultivated poise, dexterity. Kind of connect this idea to that, uh, that when we're talking about multiple intelligences, uh, that sort of bodily kinesthetic uh, intelligence that Gardner was talking about is a piece of this. Uh, and then the last one, connessione, uh, the idea that well, we understand the rec and, and appreciate and recognize how things are interconnected. And we look for the interconnected of things, interconnectedness of things. Uh, this is one of the hallmarks of da Vinci's work. If you think back to Anakin that we talked about earlier uh, today and his ideas related to feedback and systems theory, that's very consistent with the idea of this connessione uh, principle. So Gelb's book uh, says, hey, you know what? This is what da Vinci did, maybe the greatest genius arguably that ever lived. And his mind was truly and demonstrably something that we could call miraculous. And it may be that the things that he did to develop it uh, are also things that are within our capabilities. We're probably not going to be someone uh, who is another da Vinci, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't develop our mental capabilities in ways that uh, continue to feed our flourishing as humans and, and continue to drive the fulfillment of our potential. So as we have looked at history and as we think a little bit about history, there are certain moments in time where something has happened due to the intellectual capabilities due to mental processes, due to ideas and thinking, there's some things that have happened that have changed the world. And there's dozens or hundreds or thousands of these things that have happened that are the product of human ingenuity, the product of human creativity, the product of this miraculous mind that we've been talking about here tonight. Just think about a few examples for just a second. Uh, in, the, in the early 15th century, Gutenberg changed the world forever with his development of movable type and the printing press. All of a sudden, people who were out there plowing fields could learn how to read. All of a sudden, written material became available. Uh, all of a sudden, social media became a possibility uh, for better or for worse. Gutenberg changed the world through the power of his mind. Think about something like health. Think about something like how the world has changed because of the work of Alexander Fleming and others like him in the discovery of penicillin. Uh, a, probably a 15 year process of work that Fleming went through to discover and develop penicillin. Prior to this, I mean, if you think about what happened prior to the discovery of penicillin, this is the world's first broadly effective antibiotic. Before that, if you got an abscess tooth, you could die. Uh, and now all of a sudden the world has changed because of this discovery. 
uh, this remarkable thinker, this remarkable uh, individual who manifested a lot of the adaptive unconscious, who manifested some of the, of the things that Pavlov manifested. Uh, by the way, Fleming is, is less well known for the discovery of uh, an enzyme called lysosome, which is present in nasal mucus. Uh, you know, as it turns out, strange as it seems, snot has these antibacterial uh, qualities. Uh, and Fleming discovered lysosome in his, his nasal mucus. Uh, it's a part of our innate immune system. And I mean, you know, it's not exactly that he was looking for it when he blew his nose necessarily, but he noticed something. He was curious. He thought about it. He thought about connections between things. Uh, and it led to some remarkable discoveries. Uh, another Nobel laureate, 1945, he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, uh, shared with others who helped him in this amazing discovery. Here's a fellow named Jack Kilby. He worked for Texas Instruments, and he developed the microchip. Think about how the world has been changed. Think about how your world has been changed with the microchip. You're sitting looking into a screen today that's driven by microchips. You carry around this cell phone with you. Uh, and I mean, this is this little device. You carry it around with you. Uh, and the best, really the best, uh, this sounds like one of those things that maybe people say that's not true, but I think it checks out. Turns out that this cell phone that you're carrying around seems to have greater processing power than the computers that were used to put the first people on the moon. This little thing, you're carrying around in your pocket, you're dropping it in the toilet, you know, you, all, all sorts of things like this are happening and there's this amazing power that happens largely due to the work of Kilby and others like him. Kilby's another Nobel laureate, was awarded the Nobel in physics in the year 2000. Probably another gentleman named Robert Noyce should get some credit for the development of this integrated circuit. Uh, but again, the idea of how the mind works to change the world uh, is pretty remarkable. I think we have just seen something else in real time right around us uh, about how the, the amazing work of the mind, particularly human minds working together, has changed the world again. And that is in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, prior to the development of this vaccine, which, took, which really happened in less than a year, as near as I can tell, the most rapid vaccine development prior to COVID-19 was the mumps vaccine in the 1960s, that was a four year process. Now there are all kinds of things that have contributed to the rapid development of this vaccine, but one of those things was extensive DNA research for years uh, prior to how that work got applied to this vaccine. Frankly, another big piece of it was, again, thinking about Gardner's multiple intelligences, another big piece of it uh, was learning how to mobilize resources, learning how to mobilize both bureaucratic and financial resources, learning maybe some interpersonal intelligence to help people learn how to work together a little bit more. And what's happened is you're seeing the world change. There's headlines today about how the world that you and I have experienced in the state of Michigan uh, over the last 14 months or so is about to change again. It's about to open up much more. And a huge component of what's causing that to happen was the development of this vaccine. To summarize all of this, I mean, we've tried to take a really rapid, a really quick trip through several examples about how the mind works, how the computer metaphor doesn't quite work to grab hold of the multidimensional and, and, and flexible and holistic way that our minds work. We've looked at some examples of genius and how it sort of changes the world, and, and we've tried to talk a little bit uh, about how maybe we could begin to mobilize uh, and avail ourselves of some of those amazing mental resources uh, that we all have uh, because we're human beings today. So uh, I'm about out of breath from uh, talking fast for quite some period of time. So uh, if uh, we've got just a few minutes uh, for questions, I think, Joe, don't we? 
Uh, yep, yep. I think we've got a little bit of time. Uh, we run until about 8.30, but we can even, you know, go a little long, just to answer some questions if uh, you have time. So if you want to put something up in the chat or uh, something like that, uh, yeah. I'll be glad to try to respond. We've got a lot of questions already. I think uh, while I uh, am reviewing them, I just will ask really quickly um, to get us started here. Uh, you know, you, you referenced at the end here and uh, you introduced at the beginning this kind of uh, model of understanding of the brain and of computers and, by, you know, understanding uh, one through the other and vice versa. Um, I was wondering if you have any information on, like, how this kind of common understanding or rather comparison kind of emerged? And uh, wh why do you think it's so pervasive? You know, I think uh, I, I'm not an expert on the history of it. I do, I do think that, that pretty early on, uh, cognitive psychologists, uh, as they were beginning to think about how the mind worked, uh, began to think about how um, the mind it does a lot of the analytical processes that computers do. Uh, I also think uh, if you take a look at, you know, kind of the early development of computer science and, and computers, what, what they were looking for was a way to do more quickly and more efficiently things that the, that the, the mind did already. Uh, you know, everything, you know, every, everything from the most simple kind of uh, adding machines. Uh, you know, and, and ultimately what computers do uh, is calculate and process accurately and quickly. Um, and um, so I think those, those parallels uh, were more about like the product uh, and, and then sort of the understanding began to develop when we understood things like neural networks better. Uh, and the more we began to understand uh, neuroscience, the more we began to see the parallels, you know, that, that existed. Uh, and what we didn't talk about at all tonight was, uh, was things like consciousness uh, and how that uh, is, I mean, philosophers and cognitive scientists and physicists and biologists and theologians and everybody wants to talk about consciousness and how that sort of relates to this computer model of the mind. But uh, I will say that in spite of uh, my contention tonight that the computer model doesn't really grasp where the mind is, I would say that in cognitive science and in cognitive psychology, it's still the prevailing model, uh, you know, for understanding uh, mind and brain. That's interesting. Um, you actually just mentioned the um, <laughs> consciousness kind of idea. And um, I think, uh, I, I don't know if we, it's in uh, quite the context of like uh, the sense of like uh, the, the self or um, awareness. Um, but uh, someone early on in our uh, chat here uh, talked about the notion of the unconsciousness in dreams. Uh, and uh, I think when you were introducing Freud kind of was noting that sort of idea of like uh, the consciousness uh, refusing to uh, determine certain situations and the unconsciousness manifesting itself in one way or another. Um, uh, did you have any uh, thoughts on that kind of, I guess, Freudian concept and how it relates to uh, some of the stuff we've talked about tonight? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's fair to say uh, this. This may this may make some folks mad, uh, but uh, I think it's fair to say that if we spoke strictly from an empirical basis, strictly looking at the scientific information, there's really no evidence that dreams mean anything uh, at all in the Freudian sense. Now that's careful. I said empirical evidence. Most clinicians. Uh, most people who practice uh, in, in some clinical realm one way or another will tell you that in their clinical experience, dreams have tended to mean something at particular times to particular people, you know. Um, and I think it's reasonable to kind of look at and speculate, again, if we think about nuance and we think about embracing ambiguity, I think it's reasonable to say that, you know, if the unconscious is adaptive in the way that we talked about and gave some examples of, it may very well be that there's information processing that gets expressed 
unconsciously in dreams that helps us to work through things, uh, you know, in other ways and helps us to process information uh, or helps us sometimes to even manage uh, or highlight uh, particular struggles or particular conflicts. Uh, again, certainly most clinicians will tell you that, that those things are, are meaningful and, and have some clinical utility. Uh, and there's a long history in psychology you know, of looking of those, at those things. Uh, now, m- my perspective, uh, I'll tell just this is just for whatever it's worth, um, I, I'm very interested and intrigued by, uh, you know, Freud's conceptions related to dreams. Uh, I'm even more fascinated by the work of Carl Jung uh, and how Jung thought about uh, uh, archetypal manifestations of imagery and other things uh, in dreams. Um, I, I think that could open up, that, that's a whole other Smart Towns uh, conversation, I think. So. I imagine that's a, that's a very large can of words <laughs> to dive into, but I thank you for uh, touching on it. For sure. The one question we got here uh, ties back, uh, I'm kind of going through them in order, and uh, after we touched on that, um, you were talking about the, um, the adaptive ability and uh, they ask, uh, is uh, that adaptive ability what allows us to enjoy uh, working on a jigsaw puzzle? Um, you know, I think, um, I, I, I think that a lot of that is actually much more conscious than unconscious. Uh, one of the things that we know, though, about uh, the use of our mind is, uh, and this is something that developmental psychologists figured out, uh, and that is that uh, many of you are familiar with the work of Piaget, who, who helped us understand that as children's minds develop, it's not just that they're thinking better. It's not just that they're learning more. They are thinking differently differently. Uh, thought processes, information processing happen in different ways through different kinds of cognitive developmental stages. And one of the things that developmental psychologists have figured out is that when you develop this new cognitive ability, you learn to think of things in a new way, or you have this new set of mechanisms to think and understand the world. You enjoy, there's this inherent idea of joy that comes from being able to use this new thing that you have. You know, uh, and I think not that it's a new thing, but uh, there, there is joy that seems to come from being able to exercise a skill, you know, that you have. Uh, there's a lot of work in positive psychology uh, about this concept called flow um, and that I think is related to, you can think about a crossword puzzle being that way, uh, a flow experience, which is, you know, optimal human flourishing, again, another really complex com- uh, conversation, but it happens in a situation where the challenge of uh, a task connects with your ability to do the task. So, I mean, the reality is, um, a crossword puzzle that you don't have to think about, that you don't have to work hard on, that you don't that takes no energy for you. It's really not that much fun. On the other hand, a crossword puzzle that was in another language that you're not familiar with wouldn't be that much fun either. You know, it's just too much. But you can find that sweet spot where, yeah, I got to think, I got to make that, I got to work to do this. Um, and yet you can achieve it, you can accomplish it with the right kind of work. There's a joy, you know, that comes in that, that I think is adaptive. And, and maybe some of that does hop, operate on the unconscious level. Yeah, there are a lot of facets that go into uh, what uh, is cognitively engaging for us. And uh, I think that's a really interesting uh, note to touch on. Uh, we had another question here that asked about the rope experiment with Mayer. Uh, they uh, said, uh, was the person who was able to say, because I, I believe you noted, they asked like the people who kind of came up with all these reasons for why they figured out this puzzle. And I think, uh, like, I think there was a reference to like someone was able to kind of just say like, oh, I came up with it because I saw you do it. Uh, yeah. They asked, is the person who was able to say he saw the swinging cord uh, after Mayor walked past it special in some way? Did, uh, did Mayor uh, offer any explanation to this or did it seem to just be one of those kind of unexplained exemptions 
I don't th- I don't recall that he offered a specific explanation about that. I, I, he, and he was actually, uh, he kind of included the anecdotal explanations that some people offered. Uh, uh, and I, I don't think he felt that the person who, uh, or, or persons um, who might have been able to say, yeah, I saw you run into it and it, you know, it, it was swinging. I don't think he necessarily thought that they were particularly exceptional uh, it may just be that, um, you know, they were kind of more tuned in uh, and maybe more consciously watching him, you know, at the time, as opposed to maybe unconsciously uh, being aware of surroundings and not necessarily focusing intentionally on, you know, what he was doing. So that, that seems like a pretty uh, plausible explanation. Um, I, I believe we have one more question here tonight. And, uh, it uh, kind of ties into um, uh, the, these themes of learning that we had at the, uh, the latter portion of the uh, presentation. And people actually uh, later on, not asking a specific question, though, note, uh, you know, that uh, they're, uh, there's, you know, it's never too uh, late to learn. Uh, we have people, uh, you know, starting their master's at 39, getting their PhD at 57, which is uh, one offer. Congratulations to all those people. Um, yeah. But uh, in that vein, someone asks, uh, when you're talking about all these different forms of intelligence, uh, you know, they're, they're saying that uh, they themselves were not uh, particularly good at learning in the uh, mathematical, logical way, but they're good with musical intelligence and uh, learning through, like, the intrapersonal methods. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, they're, they're asking here, um, would you say all of these different me- methods of intelligence here uh, mean that uh, not necessarily everyone uh, should learn the same way as others. How do you think that affects how we should approach processes like education? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And as an educator, something that I think about a lot, and I, I could talk about a lot uh, as well. But uh, I, I guess I, if I were going to summarize, I would say um, I'm a believer in general education. Uh, And what I mean by that is, I think there are certain things across those different kinds of disciplines and areas that those different intelligences cover. I think that there's kind of a rudimentary familiarity that every well-educated person ought to have with a broad spectrum of those things. uh, partly to uh, partly to help understand what your strengths are, uh, and partly to understand the things that most grab you and most stimulate you. Uh, you might not know those things without having you know dipped your toe in the water a little bit as it relates to them. But I also think it does make a lot of sense to understand that um, you know one size fits all is probably not the best way to think about anything that relates to humans. Uh, you know, and there are the, the reality is we differ from each other in so many different ways uh, that it probably makes sense to understand better what people's strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, and then in some ways, people can make a choice about their own fulfillment and their own human development. And that is, do I want to really focus on my strengths? and really develop those strengths and really thrive in those areas? Or do I want to say, no, I want to develop this other area because I would, I would find greater fulfillment in those things as well. And I think, you know, people's ability to, to find that direction and set their course for themselves as they progress in their education would probably be something that really would be good for, uh, for human flourishing. I think that's some invaluable insight uh, from not only yourself as a, professor of psychology, but as the, the president of uh, Rochester University. So I, I think that's something uh, that we'll all, uh, you know, kind of gain a little bit about uh, hearing from you and uh, be able to take forward. Uh, I believe that's it for our questions tonight, though. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and take this time to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, Thank you all for joining us for this presentation. Uh, We at the library hope you will join us for our next presentation, which is again on uh, Tuesday, the 25th at 7 p.m. And you can register at calendar.rhpl.org. I would like to, of course, take this time to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Stogner for joining us tonight and for this wonderful enlightening presentation. Uh, If you have any final words you'd like to say to our audience tonight, please feel free to do so. 
Well, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time. You've got a, there's a huge array of uh, things that you could spend your time with, uh, and the fact that you took an hour and a half or so to uh, be here tonight is uh, is a great gift to me. <laughs> Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, it helps to make us a smarter town. Uh, I mentioned a lot of our different references, a lot of different studies, books. If you would like, uh, if you'd like re those references, my email is on this last slide. Uh, and also uh, take a look at connect.rochesteru.edu uh, as well. That's a great way to uh, connect, learn a lot about what's going on in uh, Rochester U uh, as it relates to the community um, and a lot of different ways you can plug in. So uh, take a look at those things. Thank you again uh, for being here. Joe, thanks for all your help uh, in putting this together. Absolutely. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stagner, for this presentation. Thank you all for joining us and again. Uh, this program will be available uh, one week from tonight on the Rochester uh, Hills Public Library YouTube page. So you can feel free to share it with anybody who was unable to make it out tonight or friends and family who you think would find it interesting. And yeah, I will just say thank you all for joining us and I will say have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.